All right. First speaker is uh, Cindy Cattell. She did her PhD research here with Forrest, and uh, she did the earliest ana uh, analyses of field aligned currents on auroral field lines, working with the S33 satellite. She's a full professor at University of Minnesota, and I had reason a couple of years ago to look at their faculty list, and uh, the largest minority of Minnesota physics faculty comes from here. It's at least half a dozen, perhaps more. She's a member of the uh, Stereo Waves Collaboration, which you already have heard about today. And she's um, going to tell us about the magnetosphere. Thank you. And so I have the um, rather difficult task, as all the speakers have had, of trying to compress 50 years of innovative and important research into less than 40 minutes. Um, and if we're going to talk about 50 years of space physics, we really need to have some idea of where the field of magnetospheric physics was 50 years ago. And luckily, um, the combination of Forrest and Stewart talked a little bit about some of this. But to really talk about modern magnetospheric physics, you have to recognize that there is something called the solar wind. And the fact that it was 1958 before we really had some idea about the existence of the solar wind and some theory of, <clears throat> of how it was produced. And that in a similar time frame, there were scientists using the idea of reconnection, which I'll talk about more later, uh, to de describe solar flares. And also, as Forrest said, in this time frame, early satellites made the first observations of the radiation belts. Uh, and in the similar time frame, groups you've been hearing about at uh, Minnesota, Iowa, and here were making observations of electrons and x-rays that were associated with the aurora. Now, the other question is, <clears throat> what did we know about the aurora 50 years ago? And in fact, because the aurora is something you can see with your naked eye, you don't need any instruments, um, that was something that quite a bit of work had been done on relatively early. And it really was the area in which most research was done prior to, the, to satellites. And we knew uh, at that time that the light was emitted at an altitude about 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and that it was an emission uh, feature. And this shows you both the spectrum from the sun and then the spectrum of the aurora. And that the rays were aligned along the Earth's magnetic field line, and that strong aurora could actually disrupt telegraphs uh, and were associated with global scale magnetic field perturbations. Uh, Birkeland, in the early part of the 1900s, proposed that these aurora were actually associated with electric currents flowing along the Earth's field. And then there were scientists who actually said that there could be connections between aurora and solar activity, showing plots that showed a correlation between the number of days with aurora and the number of sunspots. So that kind of sets the stage of where we were at the point that Space Sciences Lab almost founded. Now, magnetospheric physics is, as I said, a huge area. And uh, you've heard about the existence of the solar wind and about the fact that there are interactions between the solar wind and the magnetic fields of planets, or in the case of some of the uh, event things we heard about with planets, planets without magnetic fields. And the structure that's set up by that interaction of the solar wind with the Earth's magnetic field is what we call the magnetosphere. Uh, initially, because we have to slow the solar wind down to below the wave propagation speed in that medium, there's a bow shock that's set up. And Stuart talked about shock waves. There's a lot of very interesting physics that's been done here at Space Sciences Lab on the bow shock. But that, unfortunately, is not one of the topics that I'll have time to talk about. We then do get this long tail uh, that's dragged out by the process of reconnection. And what I decided to do, rather than talking about all the aspects of magnetospheric physics done here, was to concentrate just on two topics. So we'll talk about auroral physics and reconnection uh, in the magnetosphere context. And really, even in those two, I'm just going to touch on a few of the key uh, results. And one thing I want to emphasize is one of the things that really has been a strength of the Space Sciences Lab 
space physics effort is a very close interaction between theorists and experimentalists. And that back and forth has really provided us with important understanding of processes. And the other very critical piece has been this interaction between development of new instrumentation and the science enabled by that. And so in particular for what I'm be talking about today, what was very important was the development of very high time resolution, three dimensional particle distributions and that development was led by Chuck Carlson and his collaborators. And then the development of fully three-dimensional measurements of the electric field from DC up to very high frequency. Um, and that was led by Forrest Mosier, um, boom developments with uh, Dave Pankow and his group. Now, both of these measurements, the particle distributions and the electric fields, if you really want to see them in high resolution, you'd be able to send them down and to do that, um, you need high data rates, which we don't have. And so, along with the instrument development was the development of both large burst memories and data processing units that allowed you to send just the important information down and to compress the data streams. And Peter Harvey and, and Dave Curtis were associated with that. Some of you may not know that Peter actually built the first burst memory in space that was on Forrest's IC electric field instrument. I actually did analysis of that data, and um, that was a burst memory with 256 uh, bytes. That was it. Uh, and, but great science came out of it. You know, now we're flying ones with uh, you know, 10 gigabytes, so times change. Uh, and then the next step is, was really the ability to build highly integrated small spacecraft. And all of these things work together to really push forward the science that could be done here at Space Sciences Lab. Now, some of you may not have had the opportunity to see the aurora, and I know that we're going to see some images of the aurora in the next talk, but I wanted you to at least get a chance to see uh, what aurora looked like. You can see that you often get multiple arcs. These are aligned along lines of latitude and separated uh, in, aligned along lines of longitude and then separated in latitude. You can see there's a lot of time variability, uh, waviness, and obviously there's got to be an awful lot of very interesting physical processes going on to explain this. And one of the things that Space Sciences Lab has done a very good job at doing is understanding what are the processes that actually accelerate the auroral electrons and where does this acceleration process occur. Prior to some of the missions that I'll talk about, um, most scientists believed that the particles to produce the aurora either came directly from the sun, and those of you who may teach intro astronomy textbooks may know that intro astronomy textbooks will still tell you that that's how the aurora are produced. Um, often they also thought it may come from deep in the magnetotail. So the question of where the particles come from, how they're accelerated, and where that acceleration occurs is very important. Also whether it's a process that is mostly quasi-static or if it might be accelerated with wave, associated with wave acceleration. So back in, again, a, a time frame close to the, the start of Space Sciences Lab, uh, rockets observed what they called a monoenergetic peak in electrons. And here we have the log of the distribution function versus energy. And there was a clear peak in the electron energy spectrum of electrons coming down along the magnetic field uh, at an energy of tens of keV. And the question is, how can you possibly explain these observations? And it was proposed by a number of scientists, in, including a group working here, that it was actually a, an electric field along the Earth's geomagnetic field that would accelerate these electrons down to impact on the atmosphere. And this just shows you an example of two perpendicular components and the inferred parallel component of the electric field measured by a rocket, the first uh, measurement of an elect parallel electric field. Now, you have to understand that the conventional wisdom at that time, and really extending uh, up until very recently, was that you couldn't get electric fields, quasi-static electric fields, uh, parallel to a background magnetic field in a collisionless plasma 
because electrons are very, very mobile. They'd move along, they'd short out the field, and pretty soon you wouldn't have a parallel field. And a lot of the experimental and theoretical research here at Space Sciences Lab has really been devoted to elucidating how you get parallel fields in a collisionless plasma. And that's important both for understanding the auroral physics and for understanding the physics of uh, reconnection. So if you're going to measure fields, electric fields, you have to have electric field detectors. And here at Space Sciences Lab, um, <clears throat> Work was done both initially on balloon electric field detectors, uh, rocket detectors, and satellite detectors. And <clears throat> this balloon payload shows you how we make those measurements. It's actually fairly simple in concept. You took, put out two spheres on the satellites. They may be separated by a distance the order of a football field. And you measure the electric potential difference between this probe and this probe. So in concept, it's simple. It's actually quite difficult to do if you're talking about a um, a collisionless plasma. So Forrest alluded to the S33 satellite. The S33 satellite was the first satellite to fly that actually had a full three-dimensional electric field detector. Uh, it had a setup like this. And it observed for the first time the electric field set structures associated with the acceleration of auroral electrons. And I apologize, a lot of these plots are going to have a lot of data on them. I'll point out the ones you want to look at. These are the three components of the electric field. This is the electric field parallel to the Earth's magnetic field. This is the component that is equatorward <clears throat> and northward. And if you look, you can see that we've got electric fields pointing first northward and then equatorward, northward, equatorward, northward, equatorward in this paired structure. And in the middle, there's a parallel electric field. Um, the other thing that's important is these fields are quite large. They're about 400 millivolts per meter, much larger than people would anticipate uh, seeing in space. These structures were called electrostatic shocks. And this shows you the electric potential cartoon of what you were seeing. We have here those electric fields pointing northward and then equatorward. So as your satellite flew through that region, you'd see those oppositely pointed electric fields. And they're associated then with a parallel electric field. Now, S33 also had particle detectors and observed, in addition to the downgoing primary auroral electrons, upgoing ion beams. And by looking at this comparison between the particles and the fields, S33 was able to show for the first time that auroral particle acceleration occurred at these relatively low altitudes of about 2,000 to 6,000 kilometers altitude, um, and also did show very clearly that the acceleration often occurred in these very quasi-static structures. Now, I won't have time to talk about polar auroral data, but polar uh, work done here has um, given a little bit more detail to this uh, discussion. Now, another very important thing that S33 did was it made the first observations of the microphysical processes that occur in association with auroral acceleration. And this was something that could be done because high time resolution measurements were made of the waveform of the electric field rather than just looking at the spectrum. And this shows you two perpendicular components and a comparallel component and again, two perpendicular and a parallel. And you can see in the parallel component these tiny little bipolar structures. And in some cases, uh, they're more unipolar. And, and these were interpreted as being due to a structure where you had over very, very tiny scales, maybe only a kilometer or so, a Debye length. Um, you had a region where, in this case, you were missing some of the ions. So this was called an ion hole. If this ion hole um, would move over your satellite, you would just see that bipolar structure. And these would interact very strongly with the particles. And in fact, Stuart talked about the analogous electron holes and how they provided dissipation at, the, um, at some shock waves in interplanetary space. Now, S33, unfortunately, didn't have really high time resolution particle detectors. And the next step was the development of these very high time resolution so-called top hat detectors that were then combined 
to build rocket payloads that had both high time resolution electric fields and high time resolution particle detectors. And some of you will certainly recognize um, these characters. Now, one of the examples of <clears throat> observations that were made by one of the many auroral rockets flown <clears throat> by Space Sciences Lab in that time period was what they called flickering aurora. And this is aurora where the light is actually oscillating in amplitude um, at frequencies that are the order of, of 10 hertz, which is a clear evidence for a wave process in the auroral acceleration. And this shows the electron um, fluxes at a number of different energies, and then the light intensity. And you can see that the light intensity is oscillating uh, as the um, particle detector um, fluxes oscillate. And this is another example of this close interaction between theory and experiment. Uh, Mike Temerin <coughs> showed that these uh, modulations could be produced by interaction of uh, uh, primary auroral electron beams that were then modulated by ion cyclotron waves. Now, the very exciting results that came out of both S33 and the rockets motivated the proposal of the first NASA small explorer to fly, which was the FAST satellite. And this shows you a picture of FAST, and the, it was actually one of the, uh, the second actual science Pegasus launch. And FAST has done a number of interesting things. One of the first things they did is that initially people did not understand how auroral arcs could have such very, very narrow, narrow <coughs> structures. Physically, there was not an easy way to explain that. Uh, FAST had a, an interesting project in which they had planes, a plane with a very high time resolution, high spatial resolution uh, camera on board, fly under the FAST satellite uh, over Alaska. And this is the image, one of the images that was made. This shows you the fast trajectory. And this is the spectrum of the energetic electrons. And it was very clear that the energetic electrons matched up one for one with the auroral arcs. And each one of these energetic electron beam regions was associated with one of these electrostatic shock structures. So it showed very nicely the connection between the particles, the electric fields, and the aurora themselves. Now, the other thing that FAST did was it described in much more detail than had been able to be done before the association between, again, these <clears throat> perpendicular shock electric fields, the parallel field in association with it, and then the upgoing ion beams. And so if one actually integrates the electric field across the perpendicular electric field across there, one can determine the potential drop. And that's what's plotted down here. And the potential drop matches quite well <clears throat> what the energy of the ob observed ion beams are. And so this is a cartoon that shows what would be happening. The satellite is flying through this electric field structure. You've got ion beams that are coming up from the region of the parallel potential below the satellite. The electrons have been accelerated above the satellite and are coming down. So this was a very clear uh, evidence that there was quasi-steady quasi reconnection, I mean, quasi-steady acceleration associated with parallel electric fields. Um, <clears throat> FAST was also, because of its very high time resolution measurements, actually able to measure directly the acceleration of electrons in those ion solitary waves, those ion holes. So here are a number of those ion solitary waves in the parallel component of the electric field. And you can see modulations in the <laughs> electrons um, that are actually being accelerated and decelerated by their interaction with those holes. So that was a, a, a wonderful example of the microphysics. Now, so far, everything I've talked about has had to do with a region where we have electric currents flowing out away from the Earth, because that would correspond to electrons coming into the Earth to make the aurora. Uh, but what FAST found was that there was an analogous region, just like almost a mirror image of what was seen in the upgoing 
uh, current region with our down going primary electrons. And then there we had electrostatic shocks where the electric fields were pointing away. Um, <clears throat> the electric field was pointing downward and thus accelerated our electrons upward. So we got upward electron beams instead of upward ion beams. And initially people thought of connecting these with the black aurora, but in, I have to be honest and say if you really want to understand the true story for black aurora, uh, you should see that um, paper by Laura Petacolis. So in exploring this downward current region, <coughs> FAST showed that the acceleration of the electrons upward, here again are our electrons being accelerated upward, here's that integrated potential. So you saw the analogous thing that you saw with the ions. Uh, FAST also showed that there was very, very interesting microphysical processes occurring in this downward current region due to the interaction of the very, very cold, dense ionosphere uh, with the very hot plasma from the plasma sheet. And this resulted in the first observation of these electron holes in space and the first evidence for something that we call strong double layers, uh, which are a very, very strong parallel electric field confined to a very, very narrow spatial scale. And these were important for keeping uh, ionospheric plasma out of the other regions. Um, the, this shows you actually a picture there of these electron holes. Um, and there was theoretical work done by um, Machete and Roth that showed <clears throat> that these electron holes are actually a particularly uh, interesting mode known as a BGK mode. Now, really most of what I've talked so far is quasi-static, but I showed you the cartoon of the surfer, and in fact we did see the example of the flickering aurora where there were wave processes going on. And another important advance in our understanding of auroral physics <clears throat> that was begun here at Space Sciences Lab was work done initially by uh, Mallinckrodt and Carlson on what we call alphane waves. And an alphane wave, for those of you who don't know, if you imagine a magnetic field line as being a real thing and you're holding one end and I'm holding the other and I do this, I get a transverse wave in the magnetic field uh, that can carry electromagnetic energy pointing flux, um, as this cartoon shows down in, say, to the ionosphere. And Mallinckrodt and Carlson looked at the reflection of these waves from the uh, highly conductive ionosphere and how they interacted with each other. And this work was important in developing our understanding of acceleration of electrons via uh, uh, alphane waves. In this case, they're uh, kinetic alphane waves, which have a, a smaller perpendicular scale size. And you can think of this in a simple way as, as you have an alphane wave moving down closer to the surface of the Earth, the velocity of the alphane wave increases. And so you can think of an electron as essentially surfing along and getting accelerated to higher and higher energies. And the, because FAST provided these high time resolution measurements, it was able to show that that actually occurred. And this shows you, it's, I apologize for the quality of this reproduction, you can see our alphane wave magnetic field and electric field. And this just shows you the actual uh, data for the electron distribution and the results of the simulation. So really all you need to concentrate on is the fact that the simulation uh, pretty much identically reproduces the actual observations of the electrons. And this was another example of that. Again, the first time that it was shown that some of the electron acceleration was clearly due to alphane waves. So in summary, FAST showed us that really uh, our understanding of auroral physics needed to be much more complicated than it had been originally. Uh, in addition to that initial upward current region with the primary auroral electrons and the upgoing ion beams, we had the mirror image downward current region, and then this region of strong alphanic acceleration which tends to happen most often at the polar cap boundary. Okay, well, if we're going to be accelerating particles, we have to get the energy from somewhere. And the question is, where are we going to be able to get that energy <clears throat> to power the auroral acceleration? And what is it that produces the very, very dramatic time variations that we can see in the aurora? 
And you've heard a lot about the process of reconnection. This is a cartoon showing you how reconnection occurs at the Earth. Um, you can see if we have a red magnetic field line coming from the sun that's pointing in the opposite direction to the Earth's magnetic field, that those magnetic field lines interconnect, uh, drag out this big long tail, and we have reconnection happening both first here at the front and then again in the tail. If the magnetic field is pointing in the same direction, that process doesn't happen. Now this interconnection of the magnetic field allows both direct access of particles from the solar wind into the Earth's system, and more importantly, it provides an electromagnetic energy transfer. So that reconnection changes the topology of the magnetic field, so field lines that were once separate, say connected through convection, convecting core in the sun and through convecting core in the Earth into interconnected field lines, and as you've heard before, it converts that magnetic energy into particle flow and heat. Now, there's been a, a lot of work done here at Space Sciences Lab on that process. Um, there's an, a lot of early evidence that primarily just showed us that, yes, the reconnection process does actually occur in the Earth's magnetosphere, uh, which was important because many people believed it did not occur. And, and then much more recently, the focus has been on uh, how in detail can this process happen. And again, we'll be looking at evidence here at the front side at the magnetopause and here in the magnetotail. So you've already seen uh, these slides from in, in Bob's talk. Um, Kinsey Anderson had some early satellite data in which he showed that you've got impulsive acceleration of electrons back here in the magnetotail. And he speculated that there must be some impulsive process that energized electrons in some small region in the magnetotail. So that was really the first evidence that there was something going on here deep in the tail that could energize particles. Um, then later, and, and Bob mentioned this, uh, they found that these solar flare accelerated electrons also had at some time direct access to the tail. And so this showed that there had to be an interconnection between those field lines. Um, a little later, there was rocket work done by uh, Roy Torbert and Chuck Carlson showing the ions coming down directly from that front side <coughs> magnetopause region into the polar cap. Now, in a similar time frame, um, Forrest Moser and his collaborators were doing work using balloon payloads measuring the electric field in the polar cap. And this shows you a plot of the measured balloon electric field versus time, and then a model field based on the assumption that reconnection was occurring at the magnetopause, and those things agreed very, very well. So that was, again, good evidence that reconnection was occurring. Um, later, using the IC satellite, they were actually able to measure the component of the electric field that had to be there, the tangential component, if you had reconnection occurring. So by the time of, uh, say, the mid-1980s, most people were willing to say, yeah, reconnection occurred. But the problem was that the details of how the process could occur how could it possibly be fast enough and efficient enough to dump the kinds of energies that you need, say, for solar flare particle acceleration, um, for the auroral substorms, and <clears throat> was really not understood. And there are a number of kind of coupled issues of importance, uh, one having to do with the speed, um, and one having to do with how ions and electrons are decoupled from the magnetic field. Uh, and over what scale the processes occur. And so you've heard people talking about reconnection, but I'm going to go back and give you the baby picture of reconnection. Um, if you put an electron in a magnetic field, then what you'll see is that electron is just going to sit here and gyrate around the magnetic field. Um, if you now have both an electric field and a magnetic field, then the electron gyrates and it also drifts. And so this so-called E cross B drift 
uh, can also be viewed as, as thinking about a situation in which you have your magnetic field uh, connected to the plasma, or the plasma is stuck on the magnetic field, and it just drifts along at the E cross B speed. And this is called the frozen in condition. Well, if, if the electrons and ions stay frozen to these individual magnetic field lines, then you can't have reconnection happening. And so if you want to have reconnection happen, you have to decouple the ions and the electrons from the magnetic field. So that's one important point. The other important point is that the speed at which the reconnection process occurs, thus associated with the efficiency also, has to do with what the shape is of the region over which this decoupling occurs. Does it occur over a teeny region? Does it occur over some spread out region? And <clears throat> so the size and shape of the reconnection region, uh, the effective conductivity, and how the coupling occurs are all critical to understanding what reconnection can or can't do. So I'll throw this up simply because it gives you an idea of the kinds of effects that can break the frozen in condition. We can have typical resistive effects where you actually have in a collisional plasma a resistivity. In a collisionless plasma, that would have to be some kind of wave that acts as the resistivity. There are also effects that we call Hall effects that are associated uh, with currents um, perpendicular to the magnetic field. There are terms associated with electron pressure and terms associated with electron inertia. And each of these occur on uh, different sc uh, scale size. So the first work that was done here at Space Sciences Lab to clearly show the effect of one of those terms was uh, work done using the wind satellite. Um, and this, oh, I apologize for how poorly this is reproduced. Um, what we see here, hopefully you can see that we're in here in the tail region. And <clears throat> if you blow up the tail region, and look just around the region where you'd have particles being decoupled, uh, using that Hall term, you would find you'd expect a magnetic field pointing out uh, of the board towards you here, into the board there, out here, into the board there. Uh, the ones on these side are associated with particles being jetted away that way. Uh, here, they're associated with particles being jetted away that way. And the wind satellite showed here's our jets towards the Earth, and here's our jets away from the Earth. And we saw, <clears throat> or the, the wind satellites saw, that there were the magnetic field perturbations associated with that Hall uh, field. Now, um, <clears throat> the next question <clears throat> that was looked at was this issue of over what scale does the decoupling of the ions and electrons occur? And <clears throat> this is a, a data from the polar satellite uh, done by Forrest and his collaborators. And they showed here that, first of all, they do see that same um, Hall magnetic field. They also see a Hall electric field. So they saw that scale. Um, but in addition, because they were measuring the electrons, the ions, and the fields, they could compare what was the ion uh, motion and what was the electron motion, and were they the same as the E cross B flow velocity? And what they found was no, they were not. And so this was an explicit measurement of the decoupling of the ions and the decoupling of the electrons from the magnetic field. Um, and they showed that this occurred over different scales. The ions um, were decoupled over uh, something called the skin depth, which was a longer scale than the electron decoupling. Um, they also did some work <clears throat> for us working with Pritchett, doing simulations, looked at what happens if your, your reconnection is actually an asymmetric process. And they were looking at the decoupling, and they were looking at the parallel electric field, which is another signature of the decoupling. And they showed that it could occur in many, many regions over which reconnection was occurring and in a detailed comparison of the actual satellite data and simulations, they saw good agreement between the location of the parallel fields uh, in both cases. And they also were able, because they had the simulation and the data, to look at what was supporting that parallel electric field 
and they found that both electron inertia terms and electron pressure terms were important. Um, now, we don't have a lot of time. I do want to quickly say there was also work done using cluster to show that reconnection could often occur in a very continuous process. Again, some people felt that reconnection would be very bursty off and on. Uh, this cluster data showed that you could have, if you had a steady solar wind coming in, that reconnection could be very steady. And um, it may be that, that Steve will show you similar data in the optical uh, from image. Now, the, <clears throat> the last uh, new science that I want to talk about is science that was determined from the Themis mission. Forrest showed you those five satellites. And one of the things Themis was supposed to be looking at is what was it that starts this process of the auroral substorm. And uh, the auroral substorm could potentially have been generated by having reconnection onset. Some be people believed that it was started by a process happening closer to the Earth. And this is a very recent paper uh, by Vasilis using the Themis data, where they had the Themis lined up, as you heard, along the tail. Uh, one of the Themis <coughs> satellites was here tailward of the region where reconnection occurred. Uh, the others were earthward. And they showed that the substorm onset was begun by reconnection happening here in the tail, and then subsequently you had the energy uh, flowing into the near Earth region with the generation of the currents that uh, eventually resulted in the uh, strong aurora. So <clears throat> that gives you a very brief overview of some aspects of the work that have, has been done. As I said, I focused just on the aurora and on reconnection, but um, there's going to clearly be, and there is continued innovation in the instrument design and continued improvements in both spacecraft design and operations, as well as this close interaction, again, between the theory and modelers and the experimentalists to give us many new exciting discoveries in magnetospheric physics. Well, you know, the problem is, of course, that I'm an experimentalist, and so my, I always tend to feel like we, we learn the most by building those new instruments that actually allow us to much better diagnose the process. And, you know, in some cases, I think in particular some of the recent reconnection studies have really been helped a lot by the fact that we now have large enough uh, computers that you can actually do particle in cell simulations of the reconnection process. Um, but I, I guess I'd, I'd say we still, we still need those better instruments. How far back do uh, observations of auroras go? Um, as far back as there are any written records. Chinese. So you can have people, people have done studies that compare, for example, solar variations and auroral variations back yeah, to anything written in Chinese literature and way, way far back. What do you think of the possibility of uh, quasi-periodic 80-year or 200-year cycles? Well, I don't, you know, it's not something I know a lot about the research on, although I know there are people that have gone back and looked at that. And of course, you know, Bob, Bob and, and, and Stuart both referred to this issue of the fact that we're apparently yeah. in a very, very quiet solar minimum and potentially we're entering, entering something like a new Maunder minimum, yeah. but I guess we won't know until it happens. One data point doesn't quite yeah. seem enough. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>